Hello, it's a good way to start a video. I am in London for the John Moore's Peyton Fries. Oh my god, I'm so tired. <laughs> I actually came here two days ago to this hotel so that I could rest thoroughly in order to be able to do today because I've obviously got chronic fatigue issues. I've been over this before, but it didn't work. <laughs> The John Moore's Pain Prize is a super big deal. Made me super happy to be able to do it. Also kind of guilty because I don't know how I feel about prizes um, and shit. Very fun so far. Love paints. Trying to find the weirdest shit. Want the weirdest paints to win. Um, I've just got to. I've just got to get out of bed first. <laughs> I'm so tired. <laughs> I know the adrenaline will kick in, but it hasn't. <laughs> Anyway, guys, let's go do this John Moore's paint prize. Woo! So this prize is open to all UK-based artists who work with paint, and it's biennial. And we'd already done stage one at this point, which involved going through about three and a half thousand paintings on a computer screen, and just like deciding which one we had some kind of interest in. If one of any of the jury had an interest in it, it went through to stage two, which is what you see in here in the clips. And this ended up being about 1,800 paintings. And out of that number, we then had to decide like which approximately 300 paintings we wanted to see in person. Because like realistically, we couldn't expect 1,800 people to post it to the Walker Art Gallery. Like it just wouldn't have worked functionally. Um, But we had to do stage two in London because this was during Eurovision week. And the hotel prices in Liverpool were too expensive. So we were all in London instead of Liverpool. Uh, and we did it in the Elephant Building, which I'd not been to before. So while all of the judging is actually anonymous, you don't get to see the names of the artists, the jury isn't. The jury was made up of Yu Hong, who is an artist from Xi'an in China and is signed to Listen Gallery. She has these kind of like epic figurative paintings. We also had Alexis Harding, who was one of the previous winners from... 2004 i believe uh, is kind of known for these like really heavy works that kind of drip off the canvas and i think jarvis cocker was the judge when he won so kind of cool that i am jarvis cocker now Mar marlene smith was another juror she's a british artist and curator and she was one of the founding members of the black art group um she was amazing and i learned a lot from the way she spoke and then finally shyla berman who is well known for collage neon lights her obsession with ice cream and she's actually liverpool born as well she's from bootle and then last but not least us so that's serena mohammed on the left and myself gabrielle de la puente on the right we met in art school in 2013 and in 2015 we started a website together called thewhitepube.com where we have been writing about art games other stuff ever since uh, but we actually met on the 2d pathway and both had our starts in painting, so it's kind of validating and also incredibly intimidating to be invited and for people to say, okay, come and be an academic about it now. Put, put your money where your mouth is. I hope we did okay. Look who I've got. How's, how's the morning gone? I'm having the time of my life. This is the best job we've ever done. <laughs> I'm not joking. I wish every day was like this. I'll come back next year if I'll have me for free. While we nipped out to get a Starbucks for some energy, like a reader actually stopped us to say hello. Like I kind of love going to London for that reason alone because it reminds me like the people who read our text and listen to the podcast and watch the YouTube videos, like they're all, all actually real. I think that that like elation is also why these two days of judging were so difficult because we were just looking at the images on a screen. The reason like painting is so important is because it's not mediated through a screen. And oh yeah, it was, it was hard. Can you send me a text when it's connected back up? I'm just gonna go elf bar, vape out the door. Quick. I feel I'm having kicked down a door or something. No, it's back. It's back. Oh my god, can you hear me voice? I'm like, hello. Do you know what? I'm very impressed with myself for getting through the day. The way people spoke, the language that they used, it was giving me the same um, like excitement that the BAFTA jury I was on gave me because it was like strangely educational. Like there's a way that I speak about art and there's a way that Serena does and sort of that's what I'm used to, like an emotional, quick, fast reaction and 
we're very used to the words that we use because like we've built a shared language in order to make sense between the two of us but being on a jury with like four or five other people you then have to like very quickly make that new shared language so that you can act you can do the job of judging um and like words were coming up i'm like oh my god i love that i'm gonna use that i'm gonna take that and put it in my mouth <laughs> Um, the same way that when I was on the BAFTA jury, a game critic there kept saying like, okay, but does this advance the genre of multiplayer games? So I'm thinking when I'm watching the projector going today with all these paintings, does this advance the genre of painting? Um, not genre, the form of painting. Like just these little things that come into your mouth and it makes you, your brain feel more specific. It's like so satisfying to me it makes me so grateful to be able to be there so I actually just I had a notepad with me today just to write down those little phrases because I thought like yeah I want to I want to want to keep that but as I suspected the adrenaline of being a person outside the house who has to do a job kicked in and it's still sort of there um and I haven't crashed yet I'm just like I mean, there was a moment where I just had to like lie back on the couch and just let other people speak for a bit. Chronic illness, man. It makes you doubt it's real sometimes, but it's coming for me. Immediately fell asleep for three hours, woke up with bloodshot eyes, leg pain, and nausea so bad I couldn't sleep and I had to miss the next morning of judging because chronic illness had indeed come for me. Sync clap. Hello. It's Editor Gab. Web, webcam Gab. Webcam Gab. Here from the future. 24th of October. Jesus Christ. I've been busy. I wrote a book doesn't come out yet it's not coming out until next september Shh. okay pretend i didn't say any of that it was smooth smooth tran transition smooth transition i did make it back for the afternoon judging session and um, we had some like pretty big debates about the 300 patents that we wanted to see in person i then stayed in that small beige hotel for one more night one more glorious night and then i crawled home to liverpool so then all of those artists were notified and then there had to be some like crazy logistical operation to get 300 works packaged to the walker art gallery and i mean some of them were huge and some of them were like impossibly heavy and some of them were really intricate and delicate and maybe some of them hadn't even dried yet like the logistics i couldn't get my head around it but two months later all the jurors met back up at the walker art gallery and then I had the two hardest days of my career so far. And like, that's not an exaggeration. It sounds like one because how is looking at some paintings difficult at all? By the end of it, I felt like someone had put my brain in an air fryer. And one of the other judges was like, look, my eyes are bloodshot. <laughs> I was like, that happened to me last time. The difficulty is also why I didn't really take any clips while I was there. Obviously, like, I wasn't there to film a video. This is just for my own enjoyment. So I'm having to borrow some clips from National Museums Liverpool, which is what you can see on the screen now, and which comes from the footage, which is on, like, a little video as you walk into the final exhibition. But it was hard because, like, we basically had to take 300 paintings and agree on which 70 to exhibit in the final exhibition whilst also deciding on a top winner who would get £25,000 and a solo exhibition at the Walker and have their work bought to enter this historical collection. And then on top of that, there would be a few runners up and one of them would go on a residency. And like, it wasn't about picking the best 70 paintings. Like, best doesn't exist to me. I don't know what the best painting is. And then best certainly doesn't exist between six very different people who all have their own ideals. And I think at times during the conversations, we would be like, oh, we're not here as curators. We're not here to curate the best exhibition at the end of it. We're just here to select the paintings that we think are important or urgent or technically accomplished or like nothing we've seen before. Or maybe the painting is using a process that feels innovative, like it is advancing the genre. Maybe it's politically relevant or historically referential. There's just something in it that we feel as a juror represents our criticism in some 
incarnate in painting way and therefore it has to be in the final 70. I'm going to read this quote but when we were selected as jurors I was really torn about whether or not to say yes to it. I was like screaming with happiness. I was like oh my god I've just got an email which I don't often do but I was like genuinely so excited but I gave them this quote at the time and maybe it's relevant here. I said we like Weeby and me and Zarina. We like that this award is open to everybody and we hope that those putting themselves forward understand that inclusion or exclusion does not mean a painting is good or bad. It simply speaks to the preferences of the jurors and who are we anyway? Because of course, if it was six different people, that 3,000 would have been whittled down to a very different 70. And it's just all sort of arbitrary. Obviously, that's easy for me to say now that I'm on like the judge inside of things more often than the apply inside but I mention it because I want like whoever's listening to think about the limits of what a jury can do like we're not some glorious all-seeing omniscient perfect wise sage fucking art professionals like we're just people who got picked this time and in a sense we could have been any combination of arts professional you know that's why it's good that juries often change because it means that that limit can get stretched and exploded and it gives more people an opportunity to really be seen and to have their art be received. But anyway, after judging was done, I came back to the gallery a few weeks later and so did Alexis Harding because we're both little nerds who happened to be free and interested in curating the show, which was great. And it really made me miss my past life. Uh, Like before I got sick, I had a gallery called output it was great I was like the only staff member and I used to write these like big mad art council applications and I only worked with people from or based in Merseyside so it felt like for a few years I knew who was here and I knew what they were doing and it was just so much fun and yeah I just can't do it anymore so this was like a real treat for me personally and then it was time for open at night and people were coming from all over the UK and everyone was dressing very fancy and As I was walking up the front steps of the walker, I saw Catherine Lloyd, who is the project manager for the whole John Moore's Painting Prize. And she was showing me all the envelopes um, that she had ready for the prize winners. Oh my God. And I said it on Instagram, but I'll say it again. Like, why did I wear this dress? Like, I loved it. It was really fun and silky. And I realized the day before how much it actually looked like the graphic design style that loads of arts festivals and film festivals use. Like I was literally the Barrack Film and Media Arts Festival mascot for the night. And I looked good, but I felt like a fucking leaflet. I saw a family friend, Hi Gemma, who was working the door. It just made me feel nice because most of my work in the arts and as a writer means my money comes from outside of the city. So I don't often do jobs in Liverpool. I was like, arts criticism is happening here too <laughs> the john Moore's team had set up an area for me to go and cool down in which sounds silly but like uh pots means that i get hot the longer i stand up for and then heat exacerbates the symptoms and the pain and the breathlessness and the inability to think and i was due to do a speech so i was like oh shit i can't go in there all symptoms blazing my art teacher in sixth form <laughs> used to just send me out of the school we're like okay go get the bus and i'd go to the walker i don't want you to do any work in the class today i want you specifically to go and sit in the john Moore's painting prize room and like just get your education there like it is amazing to me that that ever happened i don't know about safeguarding issues but <laughs> <laughs> so catherine sent me something a few days ago from a 1997 article in the Liverpool Echo. Yeah. And it's a quote from George Melly, who is another Liverpool art critic, where he said that there were inevitably a few passionate but controlled arguments when one of us held strong feelings about a work which did not appeal to others, and a certain amount of forced trading, but not much. We definitely had that happen. <laughs> And what I found really thrilling was finally, when we had selected all the pictures and the big prize and the small prizes, we could walk around the huge warehouse where the work was all displayed against the walls, and it really looked like an exhibition. That exhibition today, I'm so grateful to have had anything to do with it. I'm so grateful for the artists for being able to produce anything 
in these conditions, it, it doesn't feel like an easy time to be an artist because it doesn't feel like an easy time to be a person. And now we can talk about the art. So I didn't want to reveal it too soon because I wanted you to feel what it was like for us in this anonymous process. Like we didn't know who made what. And that was kind of like a fun bonus of the PV. You know, I've never enjoyed a private view until I went to the John Moore's Painting Prize one because I have been looking at this art for months on end. I've been thinking about it. I've been stressed about it. And I didn't know who made any of it until the PV where people will come up and introduce themselves and I'll be like, oh, which one did you do? And the one that they did was never the one that I would have matched them with. So I had to get rid of all these biases. Like, for example, a piece of art that I would have assumed someone my age had done had been made by like an older man. And I'm like, oh my God, maybe we are going to get on in a way I didn't really expect us to. Because the art you make reveals something about you that I really like. And anyway, one of those works that I really like went to the artist who got given the Lady Grantchester Prize, which is a residency. Uh, her name is Emma Roche and her piece in the show is called Hell as in vomiting, hell, going sick and it shows someone vomiting but it sort of doesn't. It's kind of like one of those like let your eyes go blurry until you can see it kind of moments because actually what this artist does, she lays paint out, lets it dry and then she knits with it. So she knits an image with what I believe is called intaglio but it's painted and it's like, oh, it's so fun. And then once I knew her name, I could go on her website and I could see the other stuff she'd done. You know, there's like someone on a toilet, there's someone screaming. Almost looks like there are stitch markers kind of hanging off the picture. I started knitting this year and I'm like, how did I ever not knit? Because now it's all I do. And then my highlight of the night was the announcement of the number one top, top prize. And obviously, because I knew who it was, I just aimed the camera at him. Yeah, the prize that's meant obviously so much to me. I'm very lucky to be able to say that the prize winner this year is Graham Crowley. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Where do I start? I think you know I've got quite a history with this exhibition. I first exhibited here in 1976, probably before any of you were born. Um, since then, I've been shortlisted three times. <laughs> and you can't imagine the tension. And I'm 73 this year. And I said to my wife before I left, I said, Whatever the outcome, it's the last one. <laughs> I, I can't be doing this anymore. My ultimate ambition in this life is to be respected and loved, and respected and loved as a painter. Not as an artist, I don't know what that means, I think it's an accolade. But to be a part of this project for so long, and so often, ten times I've been here. <laughs> I've been a selector with uh, the Chapman Brothers. It's been a very, very, it's been a major part of my life. And although I've done lots of stuff and, you know, artists in residence and shown in New York and stuff, I'll be honest with you, it's this moment that matters more than anything else. I don't know how to say this without sounding like I've gone over to the dark side. But I think what Graham talks about in his speech reminds me of how I have come around to the prize over the process of being a juror. And it was so nice later on to go on BBC News and to see his painting all over the place and his name being celebrated. And just like the grin on his face for the rest of the night. I was walking around the PV, I was seeing friends, I was like, my mum was there. But my eyes kept going over to Graham because he felt like, like this little ball of sunshine that made me stop wanting to be cynical all the fucking time. <laughs> But then that cynicism was sort of being like chipped away at every time I spoke to an artist. Like it was some people's first time ever exhibiting in like a mega institution after doing DIY art stuff over the years or 
some people had been on the cusp of like leaving this all behind and actually inclusion in the John Moore's Payton Prize was confirmation to them that they should carry on. I even spoke to one artist who had applied for funding just to be able to travel down from another city, which was so important for them to do because, you know, plenty of artists operate completely alone. Loads of people, especially nowadays, are working from home and this was a chance to become a part of like a community and a cohort of the 2023 exhibitors. And so the other highlight for me from all of this was being able to sit down with the artists whose work I felt like I'd grown this connection with and being like a proper little fangirl and asking, you know, can I see what else you make? What's your Instagram? What's your website? What are you working on next? How do you feel about being here? How do you make it work? Do you have a studio? Do you have a gallery? Like what system have you had to craft in order for you to be able to carry on painting? And that was always interesting when it came to the people who make the really, really big stuff. Like Derek Harris, who in order to answer all of my stupid little fangirl questions, just said, well, what's your address? And I'll post you a catalogue. And then the catalogue is over here. So I've decided um, I'm going to start collecting catalogues not just any catalogue, like catalogues of the artists who I really care about because I'm realising more and more like their value and purpose. <laughs> it's like, um, rather than, you know, in between bits of work, if I'm like, oh, I want to have a break, rather than opening YouTube or Instagram and getting like sucked into a short form video fucking black hole, like I'm really enjoying picking up catalogues like Derek's or the John Moore's Paint Prize 2023 catalogue and just flicking through it. like. A adult picture book like an art critic picture book don't know if everyone else has long ago realized these exact same thoughts but I just think it's such a nice way to parcel up an exhibition once it's done or package up an exhibition because there are shows that I really enjoyed from five six years ago and when I try to google them the website's down but like I want the whole thing I want the press release and the reviews and the essays and the artist's CV at the time and I want to see the outtakes and like a catalogue can do all of those things. And I know if I go to an exhibition this year and I see a catalogue and it's like 20 quid, I'm going to be like, I don't want to spend 20 quid. But future me in 10 years time is going to be like so glad I did it because it might not seem like a historical document at the time, but it becomes one. And someone like me who has a bad memory because of chronic illness, like I'm really growing to appreciate just hard copy books <laughs> and it's just a wonder it didn't happen sooner look i've got even more i never went to the 2020 john moore's exhibition because i was super ill so this is a way for me to go to the exhibition am i sounding like an idiot has everyone else already realized that this is a thing you can do and all this catalog chat brings me here so the john moore's painting prize in liverpool in the uk has been going since 1957 did you know there has been an equivalent prize in China since 2010 and this year marks the seventh edition of it. This year, 1,702 paintings were submitted from 32 provinces in China. Rather than having like one outright winner, they have multiple prize winners. These prize winners that you can see on the screen are in the John Moore's Painting Prize Walker exhibition, but the week of the opening, they also had a separate exhibition to conclude a residency that they've been doing at the Liverpool John Moore University Art School while all the students went there in the summer. And these artists had come over from China and they were staying in the student accommodation. And I got to see the work they'd made. When I walked in, they gave me a catalogue. So we're best friends already. And I look through it every day. You'll be happy to know that the footage at the end of this video is actually the best footage I got the entire few days. And that's because I finally found the confidence to just bring a tripod and put it down and be like, yeah, I'm filming, cool. Because the studio is on the top of this. He, he just made this, uh, actually, he called this the little grey crowd or something. Yes. It was the prize winners from this year and the last John Moore's China that came around for this residency because COVID had gotten in the way of them traveling. I learned that the artist who did the glitzy paintings made his own paint. I really want to touch it, obviously. Yeah. 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 You can, you can. 
Looking back through this footage makes me really happy, but I also get this weird urgency because I'm like, oh my god, this is so cool. This is so good. I wish I had this written down somewhere that wasn't just in a video. I'm thinking like, wouldn't it be good if I had some kind of catalogue of all the art I liked? I also wanted to just include Chen's painting because I didn't actually show it in the footage, but he'd done this painting of his wife, Lisa, um, and the rest of his works in the show were cool. And I also got to see a sculpture that he'd made. And then there were pieces such as Jin's that were installed completely differently. And that was great because, you know, everyone in the walker gets to show one piece of work. But for example, the installation here was more three dimensional. It was more of an installation and I got to appreciate it more. This artist has actually donated the work to the university, so I hope next year's art students at LJMU appreciate the decor, because this is fucking great and dramatic. In a lot of the conversations I had with the artists, they just kept talking about how much they loved Liverpool's cathedrals, <laughs> and I was like, guys, me too. And I'm sure if I was an artist, they would influence my work as well. And to end with, I just wanted to include this little snippet of a conversation I had with Tan, who was the one who told me about the exhibition, and I'm so glad he did, because not only did I get a catalogue out of this, but I also got to see some art I really liked. Like this picture in the middle especially, when I showed it to Zarina, she was like, that is so GDLP core, and if you know me, you know this is exactly what I like. I know this is the second uh, Chinatown. The original one was born. Yeah. During the Second World War. This Chinatown is so desolate, a little bit silent. I didn't yes. even see Chinese. So this is a thing, imagine thing yeah. of flood. And uh, to me, maybe this just this architecture is the only witness or the survivor mm. after this uh, all these disasters. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. This this guy. This is based on a real person in 1930s. Mm -hmm. His name is Xu. Uh, he was a writer, a poet, poet and uh, he was a revolutionary and uh, we call him a, a democratic warrior. Uh, I just then uh, caricature a little mm -hmm. bit his face and to emphasize his strength of the character mm -hmm. and, uh, and at the same time it became a Chinese a, a, a portrait of stereotype, mm -hmm. stereotype. but in a positive sense, uh, way, yeah. not, not in negative sense. Why? How? Because that is strong and symbolic, iconic. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Yeah, yeah. I like that a lot. If you want to know more about the John Moore's China Exhibition, there's a whole website. And if you want to know the full exhibitor list, please go to the National Museum's Liverpool website. I am sorry that I did not cover each and every single work in this video. But I'm due to go back to the gallery anyway to film like an actual exhibition tour in situ with professional camera people and not whatever the fuck this was <laughs> so maybe i'll see you there the show's on till the end of february um if you don't make it then maybe buy a catalog oh my god buy a catalog i'm converted i'll see you on the next episode of whatever i do on the internet bye